All right, hi everyone. Thanks for tuning in tonight. My name is Travis Fortney. I'm an adult services librarian at the Willoughby Public Library. <clears throat> and we're coming to you live from downtown Willoughby in Lake County, Ohio. Tonight, we're gonna to talk to Pete Beatty about his new book, Cuyahoga. Before we get started tonight, I wanna to tell you about a few upcoming programs in our Between the Lines series coming, a, coming up a week from today on October 21st. Uh, we've got Elise Goldbach. She'll talk to us about her memoir, Rust, a memoir of steel and grit. Uh, she, she's a Willoughby resident and uh, the book is very talked about right now. So we're excited to have her in. Uh, and I, in November, we'll be joined by Dr. Michael Roizen, five time number one New York Times bestseller and uh, uh, chief wellness officer at the Cleveland Clinic. So there you go, keep an eye out for those programs. Uh, tonight, I'm extremely excited to welcome Pete Beatty to Between the Lines. Pete is a writer and editor who has taught at Kent State and the University of Alabama. I just found out he's an MFA from the University of Alabama also. Real tight. He's, yeah, he's worked for the Chicago Press, Bloomsbury, Open Road Media, Belt Publishing, our friends at Belt Publishing, and is currently an editor at the University of Alabama. He's a native of Northeast Ohio, and he currently lives in Tuscaloosa. Cuyahoga is his debut novel. I've been looking forward to talking to Pete because I just finished reading Cuyahoga this morning. It made me laugh all the way through. Uh, Pete, can we start by having you tell us a little bit about the book and read a short portion yeah uh before i start blabbing about my my stuff up thanks so much for having me here at the the willoughby library it's a, it's a pleasure um thank you carol thank you thank you travis and thanks to you know everybody who's uh uh reading the book and saying nice things about it and to the people who who aren't reading it and aren't saying nice things about it you're you are also loved um so this book started as um I started writing it in Cleveland at the Phoenix uh, Coffee House on Bridge Avenue over um, in Ohio City. It, um, it really just sort of started as a, a goofy guy with a goofy voice talking about his brother and his brother's amazing feats. And then it sort of merged with my interest in Cleveland history and Ohio history um, as I learned more about um, the Bridge War of the 1830s the fight between the east side of the city and the west side of the city over who would sort of be the, the dominant um, part of town or actually separate separate town. Um, and then I sort of uh, put it away. I put it in a drawer for a little while. And then when I got down to Alabama, I was planning to write a novel that I'd been taking notes on for a long time. Um, and I just something compelled me to take this out of the drawer and start working on it. And I got some momentum going and um, spent a lot of time kind of, um, no pun intended, wood shopping, kind of wood, wood shedding, just trying different stuff. Um, and eventually after a lot of drafts and a lot of practice, um, something that looks like the book, you know, that you hold in your hand or I hold in my hand, uh, was the result. That is, um, that's the very um, short, uh, you know, PG appropriate uh, version of how the book came to happen. There was a lot of um, self-doubt and um, flailing and feeling like I should just chuck the whole thing in a trash can. Um, thankfully, I did not do that. Um, so I'm gonna read you guys just a, just a little bit um, of from early in the book. This is the sequence where Big Sun, the sort of the larger than life hero whose who's, um, misadventures are at the heart of the book, where Big Sun wrestles Lake Erie. Uh, he fights against Lake Erie. And this was inspired by um, the Iliad, actually. Um, there's a part in the Iliad where Achilles, the hero of the Greeks, of the Achaeans, fights against the river Scamander uh, outside of the gates of Troy. Um, he kills so many Trojan warriors and fills the river with you know, dead bodies, um, so much that the gods actually get angry and send send their forces into the river and the river rises up and fights Achilles. Um, so that's where some of the inspiration for this comes from. Although my treatment is a little less um, epic than, than Homer's. Okay, here we go with versus the lake. The waters of the West was generally more polite than the trees. At first, neither the Cuyahoga nor Lake Erie seemed cross at the slaughter of the forest. The river kept snoring away like a green brown sow but a scowl stole into the lake 
every day we was washing up, fishing, emptying night pots, baptizing, tanning skins, soiling the waters. Before too long, the lake took to fussing at us, but we only acted worse for all the storms and shipwrecks. Sending steamboats crawling across the lake's face, spreading ourselves wider and wider along the bluffs, spilling more mess every day. Finally, in the fall of 1829, the lake unleashed a wild wind lasting for weeks on end. A good many trees spared by my brother keeled over. Fences and barns and houses fell. Churches were shorn of steeples. Children and other small livestock was carried away, never to be seen again. Soon we thought to rope tender creatures down, but both Cleveland and Ohio City spent that season in fear, near undone by the lake's fury. Big Sun did not see any sense in such tyrannical conduct. After some weeks of constant storms, he marched down to the water's edge, his hair flapping wet, and proceeded to scold about the inevitability of white folks that this revolt was foolishness, plumb stupid, that the lake could blow and bite all you wanted, but we are here for eternity and you ought to go along like a fellow. The lake did not talk back, but its brown blue shade of summer turned to green black and you could see it were drunk on its own might. Big scene that scolding was not the remedy. He tried to ambassador instead, saying, Come now, Airy, let us be pals. He opened his arms out wide like he would embrace the million acres of water. Wouldn't you know, the lake rose up and slapped him in the chops with stinging waves. Big grinned as wide as creation and leapt in for a fight. Man and water brawled for a fortnight. My brother first went after Erie with his axe, but that did no good. You cannot flock water. Next, he tried to drink up the whole lake, but his guts rebelled after he had swallowed down six feet, although Erie is still shallow for it, a token of Big's admiration. In a fight, water goes for drowning every time, but Big has the lungs of an elephant and could dunk for a day and a night without gasping. So the fight gone on and on, such that those who gathered to watch and wager took boredom. So no one saw when the lake finally got Big by the shining hair and tied him to a sunken schooner. Big kicked and fussed awfully and pled for a Samaritan, but a fish cannot untie a knot. After some hours of this, he finally spread his hands and bubbled, uncle, the lake were battered too and relieved to toss him ashore. Lakes do not like to have a dead body in them any more than a body likes to be dead. But this particular body should not have been trusted. Big were already at trickery, even as he coughed up a perch and gobbled lungs full of autumn air. <clears throat> Mr. Airy, I have got a bargain for you. <clears throat> We will all pack up our towns <clears throat> and head right back east in the morning. Just give me one, one good night, one quiet night to rest. No wind, no rain, no bitter cold. The lake, sore from the wrestle, took the bait. All right, Mr. Big Son, you have fought hard and you've shown a considerable common sense. I will do what you ask. So my brother and the lake, they shook on it and climbed into their sleeping clothes and laid down to await the last day of Ohio City. As soon as the lake bedded down, Liar Big went digging for the greatest rock he could find. If the lake might pin him to a shipwreck, then surely he could pin the lake to the soil beneath. He would find a, a boulder so great that Erie would have no choice but to behave. So he snuck to Henderson and Panderson's Emporium and borrowed himself a good $3 shovel. He dug all through the night, and only found regular sized rocks. From his deep hole, Big saw that dawn were crawling into the sky and Erie would soon awake. Around this moment, his shovel uncovered a great oaken door facing upwards. Through the cracks, Big marked a murmur of blood red flame and the stink of dead folks within. He suspected just whose roost this were and what would come of calling, but then he took to reasoning again. 
The father of lies surely knew where the biggest rocks were on account of landlording deep within the earth. And Big were already a liar for his false deal with the lake. The devil would appreciate such work. Big's dishonest heart would want washing out on next Sunday. So he might as well soil it further without fear. And so my brother wanged at hell's door with his shovel. There were some clattering inside and creaking floorboards. Soon enough, the door swung open. The host who met him were not a scarlet skinned demon dripping with fiery snots, but a white man aged about 50 years, unshaved and tired around the eyes, dressed in a blanket and nightcap, but not cross at his collar. The devil seen big into his parlor and poured him good store-bought coffee. Think of Satan taking Christ to the mountain and making his propositions. Back me and I will make you the master of a dozen cities. Fix us bread to eat from these rocks. Jump off the temple roof to show how much man you are. These were foolish baits that only a fool would bite. Since Bible times, the adversary had learned better lines of talk. If the devil tricked my brother, he made it look like Big had had the idea first. As they took their coffee, Big put down the bargain. If he might have a suitably large rock from Lucifer, then he could subdue the tyrant lake and ensure the future prosperity of the two towns of the Cuyahoga. The devil did not ask what were in it for him, apart from his general appetite for deceit. In fact, he sounded like any politician. I back the United States all day long. I back progress every time. I am for democracy, for whatever keeps you all busy and growing. Big, we're not sure what this meant, but he waited polite. I only ask that I might have a few prime city lots as a security for my coming old age, said Satan. Big had no lots to give away and did not like to lie more, but is it a sin to lie to the devil? By the time Big drug his great boulder up, the sun were risen. The lake were still dozing, even as early to work wagons clonked through muddy lanes, and bacon nickered in pans. The lake were still dozing, even as Big tugged the rock up to the lakewood cliff, still dozing to the very moment the vast hell hot stone thundered into its guts. The lake tumbled out of sleep, screaming about the tricks of Big Sun but couldn't hardly roar with such a boulder in its belly. Ever since, Erie does not misbehave too much, only frowns and dreams of someday drowning us. So if you've ever spent any time near Lake Erie in winter, you know that the time of year is coming where the lake just sits there staring, staring out and you, and you sort of, you can feel that it's just oozing cold weather and snow and clouds all over you. That's sort of what inspired that last bit. But yeah, that's sort of one of the, the first of Big Sun's um, feats that gets narrated. And uh, he's a little bit less successful as the story goes on. He's, he's not, quite as, um, not quite as clever as he thinks he is. Yeah, so, well, there's a lot to get to here. I, like I said, I just finished the book, really enjoyed it. Um, I. So and I wrote down a bunch of questions. You're just gonna have to bear with me here. Go for it. I'm just ready. Gonna, just gonna scroll through them, I guess. But uh, start, to start, I want to talk about Mead's voice and the style the book is written. Parts of the book, like the the almanac cover, the the little titles that appear on the top of every page, you know, uh, they look like they're right out of like Harper's Magazine or something from the 1800s. And of course, there's like an easy comparison to Mark Twain, maybe, or and you, you just mentioned, you know, I don't know Homer being a influence, but but I'm wondering if there there are more contemporary influences. Uh, the Coen Brothers, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, comes to mind. Yeah, there's the almanac. The almanac cover. The who uh, who, uh, who who drew that for you? Did, did that this come is later. This is actually a mixture of my own arts and crafts um, and the work of a really talented artist named Adam Villison, who is awesome. He's in the middle of a really cool Instagram project called, um, he draws a, a beautiful sort of like, um, like a stipple drawing of a different musician every day. Uh, he just had Eddie Van Halen up a couple days ago, but he, um, he did this drawing for me. The actual frame is, um, is a, a Davy Crockett almanac. There were these almanacs that came out actually during and at, immediately after Davy Crockett died that contained, um, 
you know, the usual things you think of at a farmer's almanac, um, uh, tables for cycles of the moon and, you know, completely random forecast that's going to be sunny on October 13th, 1836 or whatever. But they also had these wacky stories and woodcuts. So I used um, one of the frames and I even stole Davy Crockett's uh, little motto of go ahead for, for the for the slogan. I used that, I just sort of made a copy and cut it out. And then I had, had done a very terrible drawing that Adam, Adam cleaned up for me to make it look classy. Um, and that um, actually sort of leads me into where the voice came from. It obviously has, um, you know, I, I, did, I did a fair amount of homework and read, you know, period writing. Um, newspapers um, and, and sort of in the novels that were starting to come out that had this sort of like frontier voice um, that you sometimes might hear called Southwestern humor. And it means Southwestern like Missouri and Arkansas as opposed mm -hmm. to Arizona and, and, and New Mexico. Um, that was also, you know, practiced by writers like Artemis Ward who was in Cleveland for a long time. Um, Sut Lovingood was another one of these characters. Um, but I sort of got, uh, I could only approach it through the, the mind of, of somebody who lives in the early 21st century. So movies were actually really, really useful for this. Um, oh Brother, Where Art Thou, even though it's set in the 19, 1930s, not the 1830s, that kind of the rhythms of the speech and the sort of inflections with, um, Melopropisms and a kind of very rough and ready, uh, broken grammar. It's a grammar and it has rules, but they're not the right rules. Um, yeah, that, and, that definitely came to mind for me. And I was talking to my coworker about the book, you know, just before we came on, and she mentioned Oh Brother Where Art Thou as well. Sure. And the number, probably the book um, that was the well two books that were really um helped me tune in the voice were um actually neither of them are um american um one is peter carey's the true history of the kelly gang which is um much like this book sort of has a, a book within the book it purports to be the sort of last the the the, the diary of ned kelly who's kind of the australian jesse james um he's a little bit less of a like unlike Jesse James, he's not a former Confederate guerrilla who probably murdered lots of people in cold blood. Um, but he was sort of a charismatic bank robber who was, you know, beloved and you know sort of had a Robin Hood um, thing going on. And Peter Carey's novel from probably twenty some years ago um, takes this famous letter that Ned Kelly wrote from prison um, and 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 sort of updates his very kind of mumbly, idiosyncratic, very dynamic voice and um, adds a kind of like literary twist to it. Um, so that was something where I started to see like, oh, okay, like I can, I can do kind of Huck Finn karaoke. I just have to add in a few more ingredients so that I'm not just kind of redoing yeah. something that's already been done a, a lot better. Um, and then the other one was a book called The Wake by Paul Kingsnorth. Um, which is a book that is hard to describe. It's a it's written in what he calls a shadow language. It's a kind of a version of Old English or Middle English that never really existed because it's m sort of mashing together grammars and formations that didn't really exist at the same time to tell the story of a guy who of a of a Anglo-Saxon English guy who is essentially a, a, a paranoid schizophrenic who is experiencing his two sons are are killed in the Norman invasion and he sort of just loses his mind and starts talking to inanimate objects and you know lurking in swamps and it's profane and very strange completely unpunctuated it takes a, a really long time to get into the it takes 20 pages, even if you just put it down for a day or two and come back to it, you sort of have to reteach yourself how to read it. Um, earlier versions of this book were much more mannered. There was no punctuation. There were no periods. There were no commas. Um, and early, that was early versions of your book. You of, of my book, yeah. And, um, you know, I, it was cool. Uh, but, you know, when I realized I didn't have a good answer to the question, why is there no punctuation in this book, other than 
I don't know. Um, I should probably, probably put the punctuation back in. It turns out that stuff exists for a reason. Um, uh, now you've got like the original scroll version of the book that you can <laughs> you can publish later. You know. Yeah, yeah. There's a big wad of <laughs> of uh, legal pads with the the sort of yeah the, the typing scroll like Jack Kerouac. <laughs> uh, that would be exciting to read. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's pretty. It's um, it's not great. Yeah, well, so how, how did you settle on the on the grammar and punctuation as it is in the book? I mean, how I you know, I, I, we were talking about that right right before we came on too. but it, it's. Uh, I, to me, it, it was, you know, it, it, I think you were talking about it, you know, you have to teach yourself to read it and it's it's not that challenging, but there is a little bit. It kind of takes a while to and, you know, the. You, you were talking about the Goodreads reviews and there's several, you know, other people found it challenging to get into too, but then by the end, uh, I really admire the, you know, the, the grammar, the style, the sentences in the book. Um, and I, I was just wondering how you came to that style. And I'm talking about the, I guess, just the extra spaces and dialogue, the, uh, you know, other than the voice, the more technical stuff. Is that well? Um, the sort of the abstract answer is to quote my um, my grad school advisor Michael Martone, who who really you know was a big help with the book and you know read it a few times and um, but he said not about just in general as a, a sort of philosophical point is like if, if something's worth doing, it's worth doing well. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna have this kind of idiosyncratic if you're going to kind of make up your own rules like you actually have to make the rules and stick to them um there has to be some some uh you have to make it pay off you have to make it enjoyable for the reader um and you know for um i think it's it's for me as a fiction writer i sometimes felt like well that's that sounds suspicious and like you know hard work that's not why i that's not why i started doing this but uh it is a, <laughs> it is actually um uh it is work to, to develop kind of a, a syntax or sort of a bunch of patterns that you're going to follow so that the reader isn't unduly frustrated. Um, the copy editor who I worked with at Scribner, um, Asia Pollock, was actually amazing. She really helped me tighten up some of the, or just kind of like codify, codify the decisions um, of, of how it was formatted. Um, but then a lot of it was just kind of, um, I started to view the patterns of language as um, the narrator doesn't always get to, um, he doesn't really become a part of the story until the latter part. Um, so his way of, or the way I decided to, to communicate his character was through how he uses language, through his voice and through the decisions that he makes in the ordering of the words on the page, because it's very important that when medium son mead um kind of does jump in and, and you that you sort of have a feel a little bit of a of a sense of who he is um if that, if that makes sense yeah i hadn't thought about it that way but i think that worked well i mean because I, I was definitely rooting for mead before he you know before he kind of jumped on the page at the end there so um let's see I want to talk. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about. I just noticed in your bio that you know you have a lot of experience as an editor. Uh, among other titles, you acquired and edited Dreamland by Sam Quinones, which is yeah. which was a like a really important book in 2015. And like in library land, it's like he's like a sought after speaker and he's spoken all over. And um, and so I'm wondering, um, you know. I, and talking to you a little bit, I can tell you've kind of been toiling away as a writer for a while, but I'm wondering how you got into editing and how your experience as an editor informed your writing. If you just kind of talk broadly about that, I guess. Yeah, well, S Sam is awesome. Sam is like, if if somebody asked me like, what does a, what does a successful nonfiction author do? I would just say just like, go like, follow, like look at Sam's Twitter and his Instagram and his Facebook stuff and see the kind of events that he does and the way he connects with people. Uh, part of that has to do with uh, um, the subject matter that he's writing about that has like a very bright, um, 
emotional impact on a lot of people. You know, there are a lot of people who have been personally touched by the opioid epidemic. So I think his, his book is, is well suited to that. Um, I got into editing uh, really kind of by accident. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I wrote, I worked for the college newspaper in, in college and I edited stuff, but that's really, the uh, editing is a really big tent. There's a lot of different kind of very um, disparate types of work um, that get collated under this, this idea of editing and journalistic editing is no different from book editing in that it's this crazy hodgepodge of stuff. You might be, you know, copy editing, line editing, really kind of like breaking something down to its constituent parts and putting it back together and then shipping it through a content management system, or you might be assigning things, um, you know, or a half, you know, doing half of that, half the other thing and three other things and, you know, trying to figure out troubleshoot problems. Um, so I had some experience as an editor coming from a college newspaper, but that was really like making sure we got pizza for the staff meeting and making sure there were no like problematic words in the newspaper before we published it. Um, but one of my very good friends who I worked with the newspaper, um, he wound up getting into book publishing and just through, you know, knowing him, I was like, oh, that's interesting. I'd never thought about that. And I, I wound up um, getting an entry level job at an academic press. And um, that just sort of led to, you know, one thing led to another. Actually the same, the same friend was involved in moving from academic publishing into trade publishing. Um, and um, publishing, a publishing career sort of, uh, you know, is on the editorial side, it's like you, you do a lot of the, you do the work that your boss doesn't want to do for a long time, um, which is actually an awesome education. Um, and, and, you know, if you have a very humane and cool boss, like, like, uh, the bosses that I've been uh, fortunate enough to have that work isn't, um, it's less, obviously, you know, you got to photocopy some manuscripts and, 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 you know, um, deal with some boring stuff, but, you know, it's not like a devil's where devil wears Prada situation where you get like coffee thrown at your head and yelled at or whatever. So like my, my boss is Christy Henry and uh, Peter Ganay and um, are really like generous and, you know, taught me stuff and cause they, they had both been assistants in their, in their time. And um, you know, when I was working with Peter, he let me actually like edit the books um, and editorial like acquisitions editorial editing is um a really kind of um it's very feel based it's it's very um it's not something where i'm saying like that is not that's not how you that's not the past tense of this or that's you know you need to get your oxford comma right it's more reading something and then giving the author um trying to understand what the author was trying to accomplish and giving them like honest you know, kind uh, feedback that they could use. Um, sometimes that's like, have you considered moving this chapter? Other times it's like, I think you maybe need to rewrite this. And sometimes it's just little, little, you know, sort of spackling things here and there. Um, and sometimes the book is just good. Um, and you just say like, it's pretty good. And you ask them to fix like three things so that they don't wonder why you have a job. Um, and <laughs> um, the, uh, and it, taught me uh it taught me a lot of things but it mostly taught me how to be um like a how to in, interact with writing in a way that can be productive for um, the person on the other end because the person on the other end which in this case this book is me is way too close to the object in question to have anything resembling a reasonable relationship to it um you know like you never look at somebody's baby picture and just say like, Ooh, man, that's, that's, I'm sorry. That's an ugly kid. Um, but, um, and the same thing, you know, with books, it's like you can, you can help them kind of make the baby less, less ugly. Um, but they're very sensitive about it and they have to be, you really have to, you have to phrase it. You have to wrap it up in a little bit of, um, compliments and, and, you know, um, and, and knowing that, not that like, authors are childish. I'm a little childish, but that doesn't mean all authors are childish. Um, you know, um, knowing that 
I needed to be patient with myself and be kind to myself and sort of let myself be wrong and try things and screw up. Just knowing that with my editor brain that I was going to fuss and screech and dig my heels in and be wrong about stuff. Like, I don't know, not having any punctuation in the book and that eventually I would figure it out and, and do the right thing. That was, that was the part that was useful. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, it's, it's sort of just a question of like, books are, are representative of people. So you have to treat them like people. Yeah. Yeah, I had, I had the idea that writing this might have been like a reaction to your day job where you're, where you're, where you're like making the, making the baby pretty all day. And then you're like, you know, I'm going to go home and make this, you know, ugly baby, but you know, like make a baby with no punctuation. You know, I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah, a little bit. I think it was, it was important to, to, to sort of have the like punk, you know, kind of like, you know, as, at some point, somebody asked me, like, why did you put the punctuation in? And I was like, I don't know. Why did you put punctuation in everything that you write? You know, you don't have a good answer either. Um, the, uh, yeah, you know, I had, I was retired from publishing while I was in grad school, but I, I, I did notice that when I would occasionally take a, a freelance assignment uh, for something that it would totally, like, break my, my writing like radar or whatever, like whatever part of my brain was kind of capable of getting locked in and generating the voice wouldn't work for a little while while mm -hmm. I was doing freelance stuff. And I kind of had to like, just get it done, send it off, finish it, and then clear the desk and come back, come back to the creative right now. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, so switching gears here, uh, Steve, Stephen Barkley, who wrote the, who wrote the novel Ohio, which is another great debut novel about Ohio. I don't know if, I don't know if you've read that book, but it's, I, I have it's, it on my, my pile. Um, it's, it's an interesting book. It's, it's in a lot of ways, it's kind of like, it's, it's very good. And your book is very good, but they're on opposite ends of the spectrum in a lot of ways. So it's an interesting one to read. Uh, so in, in the New York Times book review, he just reviewed Cuyahoga. He said, anyone passing the building size mural of LeBron James in downtown Cleveland during the NBA stars, two stints with the Cavs understands the ferocity of Ohioans attachments to their homegrown heroes. So I'm wondering, are you a basketball fan? Are you, uh, I mean, how, how much, uh, how much of, how much of this is inspired by, I, 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 I got a LeBron vibe from uh, big son, you know, a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think I read in an interview you did recently that, you know, there's a little bit of LeBron inspiration. And then, um, and then toward the end, I mean, especially, I don't want to like spoiler at the end or anything, but Mead, you know, is, is a lot like Kyrie and, and, oh, the, how, and how he, and maybe, maybe you didn't even think of that, but, but how he, how he does to big son at the end. That's true. That's, how, that's exactly how Kyrie would do LeBron. So I'm just, I'm just wondering, uh, I you know, that... there's, there's, there's the whole, like he's in, uh, He's in big shadow. He's trying to break out of his shadow. You know, that's like a lot of the drama at the end of the book. Yeah. That's kind of like the story of the book in, in a lot of ways. Um, and you've got, you've got LeBron and you've got Kyrie and you're a Cleveland guy. And I, so. So curious. I think that you, uh, <laughs> both you and Stephen, Stephen Markley are correct that, um, that LeBron was, was definitely on my mind. It's, you know, obviously the book is set in the 1830s. There's no basketball in it. But um, the fact that LeBron's, you know, transcendent talent just happens to be on a basketball court um, is, I think, sort of, um, you know, if he was a baseball player, if, if LeBron was as good at doing anything as he is at playing basketball um, in the way that he is good at it, I think he would be similarly, if he was an or orchestra conductor or a, you know, a dog catcher, people would, would still kind of marvel. Um, that is a, an astounding interpretation that feels very <laughs> correct to me about, about Kyrie. It had not occurred to me. I hate Kyrie for, um, like, I don't, I don't hate him. I, I think he's, you can say you hate Kyrie. It's I, a, I save space. I don't, I don't root for him. Yeah. Put it that way. Um, obviously I'm, he also is the author of one of the greatest moments in Cleveland sports history. He made a three pointer that, that won the Cavs title. I, you know, I like basketball. I like sports. Um, but as a, and I've noticed this is changing a little bit with people who are younger than me. One of the like bedrock, like integral pieces of Northeastern Ohio identity is this like chip on your shoulder about the sports teams always losing. 
Um, and I've noticed that people who are, you know, born in the 90s or even like the 2000s now, they don't have any recollection of like the times John Elway beat the Browns. The Browns are just like a, a joke to them that, um, you know, and they don't maybe have as vivid of memories of like the Indians losing in the World Series. They don't have the same um, kind of, um, you know, whatever. Yeah, chip on the shoulder about about sports that um, that that Clevelanders of you know who maybe would self-identify as like Generation X or Millennial maybe maybe do, and they also don't have the same kind of um, you know hangups about Cleveland itself, about the place where they live. Um, I grew up hearing Cleveland jokes, um, you know, occasionally on late night TV or even just like they're kind of out there, you know, um, of saying like, oh, the mistake by the lake or whatever. So it always was it was kind of like ingrained into me like, oh, Cleveland, Cleveland is bad, um, which, of course, then generates this kind of like us against the world mentality of um you know, we can talk, we can say Cleveland is bad, but you can't, you know, other people cannot. Um, and so that was interesting to me because I think LeBron uh, was responsible. It was interesting to see how the Cavs winning a championship and how, how happy that made people. It felt like it, it kind of healed up some, some of the like inferiority complex that Clevelanders have um, or, or maybe cemented changes that were a long time in the making. Whereas I think young people are staying in Cleveland more and it's just like, it's, there's just a little bit less of, you know, nobody's delusional that Cleveland is like going to be, you know, replace New York city or anything. And it's just like, yeah, this is a nice place to live with nice things in it. Um, the, uh, that the Kyrie interpretation is 100% true. And I had never thought of it. That is exactly the dynamic of, of, of meat and meat and big. Right. Oh, awesome. Well, <laughs> Yeah, I wrote, I wrote down a line, I, I, you, and it's something Mead says, you don't know you can, or you, I don't know, it's something the dog says to me, he says, or it's like the ghost of dog, so it's really Mead talking to himself, but he says, you do not know if you can be happy yoked to him, you know, when they're yeah. talking about, you know, that's, that's Kyrie and LeBron right there. It sure is, yeah. yeah. All right, another, another review question here, so, and not, not that, not that you read your reviews or should. Never, or whatever, never. But, but in, in the LA Times, uh, Mark Ethetakis uh, praises the novel, saying, "Pete Beatty's funny, rambunctious debut novel, Cuyahoga, is not a Trump era allegory. It could be read with pleasure in 2002 or 1950. It's a satire of tall tales, but not a distant, too cool treatment." Uh, my question is, do, do you find or do you think that setting your novel in the past allows you to explore these tall tale type tropes more easily? Um, I mean, do, do you know what I mean? Like, like you're, mm. you're, uh, right, you're in a way you're like giving Cleveland an origin story or a, or a sense of pride or a tall tale to hang its head on. Um, if that's your motive, is, is setting it in an 18, you know, setting it in 1830, is it what, 1837, is that the year? Yeah. Is that easier than 2002, say? I think it's something where, for me, I think my goal was to, obviously, like, there was this historical event that sort of pushed me to this year. Um, but what I found was that writing about 1837 might as well be the middle ages you know compared to today even compared to putting a book in the 1937 or you know the 70s or something like there's no cars there's no um you know i don't think there's really even like a telegraph there's hardly any railroad um but it essentially what it did was i think it created like a safe distance where it's the past but it's not like it's not a past you're super familiar with um it's not a past, that particular sort of slice of, of, of time, like the Jacksonian era, the early Republic, I think is not, um, it's not like the first place anybody goes to when they're like imagining American history. Uh, it's not 1776, it's not 1865. Uh, it's not, it doesn't have like a big war associated with it. So I, I really appreciated that defamiliarization that it made possible because it just like, it makes the reader, um, 
a little bit more open to whatever's happening. It also, there is a tension where the book is not about Donald Trump. Um, he wasn't even president when I started it, but he illustrates some of the things, politicians in general and, you know, sort of the kind of sour um, nature of, of politics right now. Um, I think touches on this thing where like we, and I don't think Americans are uniquely guilty of this. I think we're uniquely uh, prone to it. Um, we, we have very vivid imaginations. We tell some crazy stories to ourselves that we know are lies, that we know the second they come out of our mouth that they are lies. Um, George Washington died in 1799. Uh, pretty much before they, as soon as they had the dirt over him, a man named Parson Weems wrote and started selling a biography of George Washington that had some crazy stuff in it. Like George Washington never told a lie, cherry tree, things like that. Um, turning George Washington, apotheizing George Washington into this divine figure, into this father of the country. Um, it wasn't true then. I, I can't speak for Parson Weems, but I'm going to. I'm pretty sure he knew it wasn't true. Um, but it was a moral lie. It was an instructive lie that was meant to tell some kind of story about the man who could be called the father of the country or whatever, the first president. It was supposed to put a certain spin on it in a way, um, even though, you know, a grown up reading that story in 1801 would probably say like, okay, yeah, he probably, he probably didn't cut down the cherry tree or he didn't lie about it or whatever. Um, um, and, and that has really been a pattern that keeps going. And I think it's, you know, there's a, um, a very famous book of, of sort of critical, um, not theory, but it's a sort of pointy headed academic book called Imagined Communities that talks about how countries are really all the idea of like an ethnic nation is, is, is really predicated on the idea of like agreeing on a lie and sticking to it to the exclusion of other people. Um, and that um, I wanted to set the story relatively early in American history. I found that having the story set then, I like just got me a little bit closer to the action in terms of like, because all of these stories, um, and, you know, not to not to show my political leanings or whatever, all of these, you know, completely implausible, non-factual claims, we're going to build a wall across the border, um, or, um, you know, and that's not just to pick on Donald Trump, although, well, whatever, less said about that. They have. Um, I was gonna. I was gonna throw you like a say something political softball with the next question, but but go ahead and do it now. <laughs> um, you know these these sort of uh, lies are. Um, you know I think even it's like a lot of the people who are hearing them know full well that they're lies, but they're uh, they're a lie that that establishes some kind of power dynamic or some kind of relationship or some kind of narrative about the way things ought to be uh, or the way you want them to be in the future. Um, and I think tall tales are very similar to that. Um, you know, the stories that, that inform the creations of, of, of Big Sun are these kind of macho, uh, you know, what you might think of as like the strong, you know, the, um, individualism that marks the American character. Um, but I decided to, one of the things I thought would be, would make it fun and make it interesting would be to make the kind of like let, it's like in a, in, in Blazing Saddles when like the, the set falls down in the Western and you see like, oh, that building was just a, a, a set, you know? Um, you know, when that happens in a, in a cartoon um, to see the, the, the lies that we tell, the crazy stories that we tell about ourselves are very often projections and that they're, in the case of a lot of the stuff that happens in this book, you know, what you might think of today is like toxic masculinity of, you know, viewing women as something to be obtained um, to sort of maybe show that, you know, have that happening in the background and you can see right through it and, and see it. Um, so, you know, it's like, um, I think there's a there's a faux naivety to a lot of the nation building and place building crazy stories that we tell. Um, 
And that's true about Cleveland too. Um, I mean, what, not to get too even more political, but you know, all of these things like, oh, Cleveland's coming back, Cleveland's great. It's really just like some young people are moving downtown you know, and it's probably not going to rejuvenate the tax base to the point where like the city's actually functional um, and experiences a widespread equitable, um, you know, kind of economic boom. It just, parts of it are going to gentrify. Um, and I, I don't pretend to know how to, to fix that. That's something that's happening everywhere. Cleveland's not uniquely guilty in that, in that respect. Anyway, so Lob me the softball if you want, or <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, you've you've done that's that's, that's enough that's politics. Enough. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm I'm embarrassed that I, I didn't know about the bridge war thing, but I, but I was gonna. I mean, I I didn't I didn't know any of the history of and uh, for whatever reason I found the book so entertaining that I wasn't compelled to you know go to Wikipedia or whatever. Um, but, uh, I, so I w but I was curious and I was going to ask you, you know, what, how much of the book is historically accurate? What, what research did you have to do into the historical part? Um, you know, and how did you, uh, right. um, how, did you how did you do away with, or, cause it certainly doesn't read like a history in less than no. its final no. form. But. Yeah, it's um, it's if you were actually trying to learn what happened in Cleveland in 1837, I do not recommend starting with uh, with my book. Um, <laughs> the um, which is to say, there's I, I I tried not to to like totally you know tell to like intentionally change anything. Like there was tension between the east between Ohio City and Cleveland over where a bridge would be located, and the location of the bridge favored Cleveland. Um, there were um, multiple attempts to destroy it um, that were um, no no one no one owned up to. Um, there was a lot of very uh, spicy talk in newspapers um, about you know how bad one side was or how how heinous the other side was. It really would fit right into the political kind of discussion in, in 2020. Oh, and a lot of other times in American history. Um, it was also coming at a time of widespread civil unrest in the United States. Um, not like mass demonstrations, but just a lot more like mob activity. And um, my dad once made the observation that the 70s were a little bit more interesting because the less stuff was getting filmed. Um, and, you know, people would occasionally misbehave in ways that if they happened now, um, you know, you would be, someone would have their phone out and filming you and you, would, you know, it sort of it would be all over the news. Um, I think the 1830s were um, pretty, pretty nutty uh, or, or much, a lot made the 1970s look like uh, kindergarten. The, um, and there were multiple pitched battles over the Columbus, what was then the Columbus, the Columbus Road Bridge in Cleveland, um, which still exists. It's a, it's a, there's still a bridge in that spot. It's it's now a very nice, big, cleaned up lift bridge as opposed to a covered bridge. Um, that is about where the truthfulness ends. Um, the there was a cow. So I'm not without spoiling anything. There's a there's a a, a cow in the book who meets a sad fate, um, and that is the only casualty I could find in any account of the the, the bridge war is that a cow died. Um, somebody got stabbed and a, and a cow, a cow died. So I, I did use that, um, sort of borrowed that. Um, but ultimately the, the narrative history of the bridge war is kind of confusing. There's no clear account of, <sighs> it really does seem like something that was, um, driven by animosity and doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It just, it does, the big slogan in this, in this incident was two bridges or none. Um, but as I, I think I, there's a joke about this in the book and I've said it many times out loud, one bridge is clearly better than no bridges. Uh, <laughs> it's you can cross the river in one place as opposed to no places. But I think it, it really just was kind of this kind of civil, civ, uh, 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 um, coming at a particularly feisty moment in time where a lot of people were broke, a lot of people were drunk, um, and the stakes seemed maybe artificially higher than they really were. So you had these sort of outlandish brawls 
um, <laughs> over the bridge. I mean, not to not to go back to the Trump allegory thing, but you've got the high stakes. You've got people, you know, drinking a lot. You've got uh, you've got uh, the political skirmishes. You've got the. I, I think I'm starting to think it is a Trump allegory after all. Maybe, maybe yeah. you can't maybe you can't escape being a Trump allegory in 2020. Yeah, know. that's that's probably the the truth is that <laughs> we're just the the present has this enormous gravitational power that sort of bends everything towards it. And so, you know, trapped as we are in the year 2020, we sort of look at, out at everything and say like, oh, that's just like today. Um, the, um, I wanted to try, kind of have my cake and eat it too, which is to get the like funny, wacky feel of the past where everybody's, you know, full of whiskey and goofy, but not make it so unrecognizable that it, that it um, seemed like, um, silly you know yeah so speaking of silly that's a good segue into my very next question <laughs> but two two things made me laugh again and again through the book other i mean and maybe it's just my sense of humor right but but i love the repeated jokes about the night pigs and creosote that like even think, i mean it just it makes me laugh now thinking about it and and i liked all the slapstick style humor you know, all the physical humor too I'm wondering if you think there's a particular brand of comedy that's specific to Northeast Ohio. I'm tempted to call it like sarcastic potty humor, but you probably oh is for there sure a better yeah. way to classify it. <laughs> I think that there's sort of um, to me it feels almost like kind of um, like a lot of people who were my age. I was born in, in 1981. I um, caught the tail end of Cleveland's tradition of like local variety shows. Um, I think they're probably their, their most visible legacy is Big Chuck and Little John, who yeah. I, don't, I, I, I honestly don't know if they're both still still with us, but um, they would sort of always be on, you know, and they sort of had this, um, you know, gleeful, puckish, but like very amateurish, very low rent sort of sense of humor. And I think that, uh, well, obviously I'm, I was too young to ever see Gilardi. Um, I think that uh, influenced, you know, Drew Carey show, obviously. Um, and, but also just sort of a, even like Mike Polk's videos, uh, you know, where he's yelling at the Brown Stadium or things like that have, um, do have this kind of Cleveland sense of humor, which is very, it's like, it's not quite dry. Um, it, it's It's got some saliva <laughs> um but it, and it, it sort of privileges like the absurd um you know um absurdity and um like a, a willingness to make fun of yourself um i definitely it was very it was something i really wanted to do and i, I appreciate you saying that that it, it fits in the, the northeastern ohio school of, of, of humor um yeah there's there definitely is a cleveland sense of humor yeah, I mean, my, my dad loves the comic strip, which I think is a local comic strip, uh, Frank and Ernst. I don't know if you, oh, yeah. yeah, but he's, he's a big fan. I think he would, I think he would uh, snort laugh at parts of this book. Too. Yeah, even Cal <laughs> Calvin and Hobbes, to be honest, has, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, big Northeastern Ohio ties. I think that kind of manic um, energy, but that also has like a willingness to be sentimental, um, to, you know, be, to have some like emotion in it. It's pretty... It's yeah. something I aspire yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. So local interest is very popular here in, in Willoughby and in, you know, Northeast Ohio. Oh, yeah. It loves talking about itself kind of thing, like a lot of places probably. And, and people will enjoy your book, you know, for its regional flavor, I guess. So I'm wondering if you have any recommendations for books about, you know, other Cleveland novels, other uh, Cleveland or, you know, Northeast uh, Ohio history. Uh, do you think if you're not, you know, do you think of Cuyahoga as being in conversation with any local books? For sure. Ever? Yeah. Um, so I would say um, there is a writer named Raymond DeCapite. I, I could be saying his name wrong. It's D-E-C-A-P-I-T-E. Uh, who lived in Tremont in the 50s. He, he was the son of Italian immigrants. And he wrote a bunch of novels that I think are really awesome. They're sort of, um, you know, they're, they're older. So they're a little, um, they can feel a little bit dated. Um, but 
he has one about um just like an old guy who kind of is just like a yard bird at the at the horse track um a couple others i think uh the coming of fabrizi is his, is his big one um he you know briefly had a kind of a uh, moment of of fame um i think in the 50s is kind of like cleveland's version of jack kerouac mm -hmm. um i i dipping into one or two of his books i think is great i think he's underappreciated and I, I really think it's uh, like doing everything local is i think i have some guilt about the fact that i don't live in cleveland as i blab about cleveland but you know the, the more <laughs> so, the more we kind of like sing our songs you know the more we think about what makes cleveland special um and share that with with the world like the, the better everybody is Raymond DeCapity, um, the uh, D.A. Levy, who was Cleveland's like weirdo poet, uh, is awesome. Um, yeah. His his stuff is really cool. It's a little profane. His story was very sad. Um, the um, Ian Fraser, who writes for the New Yorker, his book Family has a the first half of it is is very much about the history of of Northern Ohio. It's very good, and it led me to a book that to me it was like a treasure trove, like an absolute treasure trove, which is the history of the Northwest uh, Territory by uh, a, a historian named H.C. Bewley, B-U-L-E-Y. It's a two volume history written in the 50s that is just, it's so good. I mean, it's like, I would occasionally like have to put it away to, um, to get back to writing because i just i just lived inside that book it's so great um and it's got stuff like speaking of like the creosote for the teeth it has like chapters about like dentistry and the old frontier and at first be like oh my god how much could there be to say but they're really just, just these it's 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 older so you know it's it's not telling particularly sophisticated stories about history but man is it it's so rich and fun it's just a total it's the only book I've ever read where I felt like I was getting a sense of what it actually was like to be like a, alive in that moment in that place. Um, so that, have, that you, was... have you read the book McTeague? I have. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's that's a good uh, <laughs> book about a mad dentist. I don't know. Uh, yeah, Frank Norris. That's a that's a yeah. that book is a. Is I mean, and, and it's you know similar era to mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's tons, there's lots and lots of really good writing about Cleveland. You, know, you mentioned Belt, um, where I briefly worked. Like, they have been putting out great, great stuff about Cleveland, both in their magazine and in their, um, and the books that they're now, they're reprinting some old books. Yeah. Um, those are my Cleveland writers that I kind of, um, that I, that I stand for. Yeah, sweet. Yeah, we, we love Belt Publishing. We've had several of their authors and, uh, yeah. Ted McLellan was a, always a popular choice. Yeah, us. Ted is great. I actually worked with Ted. Uh, I edited a couple of his books. Uh, at oh, really? Yeah. His, um, did you did you do the How to Speak Midwestern one? No, that I was think, all that I was think, all Belt. That one's a classic. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's it, it's just that's just so popular with the library audiences. I don't know. Um, so, a couple more questions, and then that's it. But. So there's a, I want to talk about, this might be putting you on the spot, but Go ahead. whatever. So there's, there's a passage where Mead imagines leaving Ohio with Big, then, then staying after Big and Clove left, finally leaving with, or not Clove, Chloe, I guess. Uh, I just had David Giffels in for talk and he, he writes, and he, he blurbed your book. I don't know if you know him, but. <laughs> no, I don't really know him. He was very yeah, kind but, to give me a blurb. Yeah, he, blur he blurbed your book. He, he talks about uh, the topic of brain drain of the best and brightest, you know, Clevelanders, Ohioans leaving uh, Ohio. So I, I was wondering if you could talk about, you know, what led you to leave Ohio if you ever think, if you think you'll ever come back. Just, just out of curiosity. I, I just, I thought about that reading that passage of the book. Um, yeah, and and with the Giffel's blurb, you know, so it's something that I think about a lot. And uh, you know, I've said my a lot of my family is, is is still in Ohio most of the time. And um, you know, growing up, I think it was just you know normal, um, or you know, I experienced the discomforts of of, of being a teenager the same way to everybody. You know, your hormones kind of drive you crazy, and you're awkward, and you know, you, you know, you feel like a mutant. Um, and for me, 
for whatever reason, I think I externalized a lot of the blame for that onto like where I lived. Um, so I was just like, oh, I'm getting out of here. Like I'm not going to college here, I'm gone. Um, and you know, once I was gone for a little while, I started to realize like, oh, actually I, Ohio is fine. I just, I, I sucked, it wasn't Ohio. Um, and, and then, you know, um, it's hard to kind of make your way back. Um, you know, I came back for a little while um, and I'm, oh, I hope well, maybe at yeah. some point I'll get to, to live here again, but um, to live. I think when I wrote that question down, I didn't realize you, I mean, you went to Alabama for the MFA and yeah. that's um, not to give you a hard time, man. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> No, it's totally, I think, um, like the number, like, as I mentioned before, like, like the Cleveland versus the world mentality is, is a important piece of kind of a regional, um, like chauvinism that we need to, we need to explore and enjoy. I'm just like, own, like we're, we are Cleveland or, you know, we're sort of Northeast Ohio and only, we are the only ones who get to talk about it, you know? So I think it's only fair to ask why somebody who lives in, a different time zone is writing books about Cleveland. <laughs> so you came for a couple more questions about the book. And sure. then, yeah. yeah. All right. So questions about passages from the book, just short passages. Chloe or Chloe says, and I think the section is called Chloe's version. Mm -hmm. uh, she says, there's no big sun at all. There's only sort of actors in a costume, a wig and a neckerchief. All those feats are just different folks regular folks, not spirits dressing up in the suit. So I was wondering if you could talk about the idea of spirits in the book. And do you think Chloe has it right in what she's expressing there? She seems to think that spirits are defined by their legend where everyone else thinks they're defined by their deeds. So yeah, right. Chloe is 100% Chloe is is the is usually right in the book, or is the closest thing to what I I think might be might be the truth. Um, not to not to spoil too much about the book. The um, the idea of the spirit is supposed to represent everything from the costumed superhero, right, like a caped crusader, to someone like LeBron James, who's kind of like a wears a, you know literally wears a shirt with the word Cleveland on it. And sort of becomes this representative of Cleveland. Um, not for nothing, Superman was created in, in Cleveland too. Um, and, but also to try to like wind it back towards this more um, like an old fashioned idea of a divine, of somebody with magical powers. That could be a religious person, um, you know, something like. The healing miracles that are attributed to, to especially holy people, uh, to saints, to, to, to Jesus himself, um, or something a little bit more less serious, like Davy Crockett, he killed a bear when he was three, you know, or, you know, half horse, half alligator, um, or someone like Achilles, you know, who's half divine and, you know, is, um, can, can beat anybody in a fight. That's I wanted the spirit to kind of gesture towards a really kind of big, broad definition of, of a person who does something magical. Um, and that could be like a Kardashian who's just so famous that they kind of distort reality around them, or it could be, um, it could be you know, um, a savior or a saint, something like that. Um, I, I do tend to think that we, that to, to answer your question directly, like what Chloe's would, would say if she were here with us uh, is um, that like we only need this idea of the hero to tell these stories to do something we need the actual stuff that they do we do that you know um, you know like I, I'm reminded sometimes of um, you know talking to religious to you know priests and, and, and pastors who will often say something like we are the church you know like you the other parishioners myself are the church the church isn't you know isn't the bank account of the church it's not the building it's the people in the in the building and i think that that same thing i think holds true for um you know the sense of at, when we're at our best when we're taking inspiration from stories of ridiculous superhuman stuff we use it to sort of be a little bit more heroic in our in our own lives um you know and that there's a lot, this, this opens up some, 
pathways towards whole warehouses full of cans of worms of like, well, what if you start taking inspiration from people who aren't that heroic, you know, or like, what if someone's one person's version of heroism is, you know, some is putting kids in cages or, you know, things like that. Yeah, it's, I, I, it's funny because I kept like, as, as I was reading it, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't write a quote down to pin it down or anything. And I was going to ask that question if it's, uh, you know, because I, as I was reading, I kept thinking, huh, that sounds mildly biblical, or that sounds like, and then I was, and I was wondering if, you know, if it's, if, if it's meant as a, if parts of it were meant as a, I don't know, commentary on religion or something, but I think you kind of answered that. I mean, yeah. No, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of yeah. <laughs> it is. It is. There's a lot of Bible in here for sure. A oh, there is. Stuff. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm. I'm not really. I'm not. I'm not super well versed on on my Bible, but uh, <laughs> but uh, but I, I guess I guess uh, if someone was more well versed, they would probably. It's okay. You know, I see I've, it even more than I do, but yeah. There's. Um, I think I maybe overestimated the how how preoccupied the average book reader is with <laughs> the Bible. <laughs> yeah um <laughs> all right just one one more question about the book uh and then and then one final question and that's it uh so well i, I probably should ask this a lot earlier actually but after fessing up that he's been tagging along to dogs ex exploits Mead says the third exploding i gone because i like to to me that was a kind of that, that was kind of a key moment in the book where Mead, you, you thought so too. I mean, where Mead kind of uh, discovers or admits what he likes. And my question is, I guess, uh, you know, how important was is Mead's self-discovery or how, how important is Mead? But of course, we I think we already covered that. So yeah, he's, <laughs> I mean, Mead is, is, um, yeah, I hate to say it because I hopefully I'm not I don't do some of the stuff that he does in the book, but he he represents a lot of my own um, insecurities. Um, I'd be lying if I said that wasn't true, or things you know that I worry about when I you know can't sleep at night. And I think one of the things is that he very often doesn't realize what he wants or what he's doing until it is spoken out loud, and then it kind of like it all sort of incepts you know of like oh my god this is what i want all the time um so his his kind of um his flaws his character flaws are um i think they're they come as news to him when he <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I get that though yeah um all right last, last question you're you're wearing the you're wearing the indians 1993 shirt there oh yeah or is it, and and I'm wondering, you know, you're a creative guy. You're from Cleveland. Give it some thought to our mythology and heroes. So, what should the Indians' uh, new name be? <laughs> I am a sp spider guy all the way. Oh, you I'm, are. I, yeah, I think it's yeah. one. It's distinctive. Um, it's weird. Um, it has all kinds of built-in, you know, merchandising stuff. Yeah. But I, I I love that it. Um, is a team that, that did exist in the 1890s. Um, I think that's just like the coolest thing. Like they were the spiders before before the Indians ever ever existed. If they were going to do something totally new, I'm gonna. Uh, all I ask is that it not involve guitars or rock and roll. That's all. <laughs> I, I Cleveland say, rockers. Yeah, the Cleveland rockers. Rocks. Are the, you know, <laughs> yeah, man, uh, not good. Yep. Just make Drew the Drew Carey theme song, the new Indians theme song. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think I think as long as there's no guitar, I'll I'll be fine with whatever it is. Yeah, it sounds good. Well, that brings us to the end, Pete. Yep. I I really enjoyed talking to you. I love the book. Everyone, go out. I, you know, everyone. If anyone's still hanging on here, which people are, put a put a hold on a copy of the book at the library. I. Uh, I purchased 12 copies to do a merchandising display and then they all just came in today. So, nice. so, so, uh, you know, come, come get it. It's a fun. Yeah. Movie. Come, there's coming in hot off the presses. Thank you so much for bags. having me. Yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Once you've uh, read the library copy, please go out and, and buy a copy so that maybe I can